All righty. So my name is Braxton Fleming. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Stealth Bros & Co. Uh, we are a luxury dock kit supply company that provides travel and at-home personal storage for all medical injectable needs. Um, the way that I started this business was I am a transgender man and I needed somewhere to place my hormone replacement therapy medications. Um, I actually started transitioning about five years ago when I was 27 years old. And as I was going through my transition, I realized that there wasn't any place for me to put my hormone replacement medication. And the more I watched different trans men uh, along their journey, I realized that they didn't have a place either. Um, so I went to the store trying to figure out, okay, wh where, where can I place this? Where can I place this? And there just wasn't anything specific to the transgender community. Um, that looked really nice or to any community at that matter of fact. Um, so about, you know, a year into my transition, I had watched so many videos, I had looked around and I just said, you know what, I'm going to create this product um, to help raise some money for my top surgery and it'll be a good way to become more part of my community. So that's when um, I went full throttle and started Stealth Bros and it's just launched ever since then. Uh, we also have something called a Stealth Bros Support Fund where we give back annually to the transgender community to offer financial aid in any and all transitional needs, um, which is really cool because the whole point of this business was for the transgender community, but as time went on and as we started to grow, we started to realize that it's not just us who need help, it's so many other communities, which is a really cool thing. Um, so I just wanted to go into, hold on, there we go, into our first main product, which is our original DOP kit. And this product is um, like your standard toiletry DOP kit, but um, it has more style. And that's what really Stealth Bros is all about, is about bringing a luxury style DOP kit to you to support you in your journey um, and to help you get through the day or the week. And this is pretty much for your bulk supply of medical needs. So like your alcohol pads, your syringes, band-aid box, um, etc. Then we have our go-to junior dop, which is just basically conveniently made to store it in an organized way so that when your shot day comes up, you're not full of anxiety, everything is ready for you, and you are more than welcome to take this with you. If you're not ready at that very moment to take your shot, this gives you that freedom to, um, to live your life freely, and that's what we're all about here. Uh, our last main product is our Stealth Sharp Shuttles. And these are actually sharps containers that are used for your used needle tips. So after you give yourself a self injection, if you're on the go, if you're at home, we have these really neat stylish um, sharp shuttles that go right within the junior dop or multiple can fit within our original dop and that keeps you safe while traveling or while you're at home if you have kids or pets. And we also have, um, a new sharps container, which is a one liter sharps container. And these will be offered in various colors so that people who have to self inject on a daily basis or a weekly basis and they're at home, they don't have to have some ugly medical yellow box on their table. They can have something that's unique to them. So that's what we're really trying to do here is just pretty much enhance the lives of those uh, with unfortunate circumstances like taking uh, medical injections. Um, but I just wanted to say that thank you guys for all listening to me. And that's all about Stealth Bros & Co. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Braxton, for the presentation. Okay. Hi, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end um, after all the recitations run. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, River Nice. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Give me one second here. Okay.
So my name is River Nice. Thanks for having me. My pronouns are they, them. So if you're unfamiliar with that, please refer to me as they instead of she or he. I am a financial planner. I own the firm Be Intentional Financial, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, I'm based out of Philly, but I've been a virtual business since even before the pandemic. Just made sense to me at the time and then worked out when the whole rest of the world moved virtual as well. Um, I've helped over 100 clients since launching two years ago. Uh, I provide several different financial planning services, but I am focused on LGBTQ folks in their 20s and 30s. And I'm focused on education, not just investment management. Um, and I actually don't manage any assets myself. I don't sell any products. I provide advice and education for folks to be able to decide what they need to do to live their own lives. Um, the main service that I offer is working with me for six months. Uh, so I like to have, give folks an end date, give folks a place where they feel like they can graduate into the next step of their financial health instead of just an ongoing indefinite relationship. So in that six month period, I help younger folks um, establish their financial foundations. So we create a budget, we figure out a plan for their debt, which is oftentimes student loans, sometimes credit card debt or car loan or mortgage or something else. Um, I help them figure out their savings goals. So a lot of times when folks come to me, they're like, I wanna buy a house, but I don't even know what houses cost or how that process looks like. Um, or I wanna adopt children in a few years, but I have no idea how much that costs or what that looks like. Um, so I help them get clear about their goals and how much those cost, and then create a sustainable plan to get there and a realistic timeline for them as well. I also help folks understand their workplace benefits if they have a job that offers them benefits. Uh, a lot of times folks have access to a 401k but don't know what that means. Um, if somebody does not have access to benefits through a job, so they're self-employed or a freelancer or something along those lines, I help them understand what are the other things that they need to set in place for themselves that they're missing out on because they don't have uh, that opportunity through a job. Um, so that also looks like evaluating their life insurance coverage and disability insurance coverage and letting them know if they're gonna need some more to protect themselves and their families. I also teach folks about their credit scores. I think there's been a huge gap in the education system of not teaching us how to manage our own credit scores and what it means for our futures and our financial health. Um, so helping folks understand what's going on with their own credit scores and what they can do to improve them and how that affects their ability to secure housing and to, uh, use debt as a tool to get the things they want out of life is really important. Um, and then, of course, I do a little bit of retirement analysis to help folks see how they're going to be able to build on what they're doing now in the day to day to their financial health and financial freedom in the future. Um, but since I primarily work with folks in their 20s and 30s, I'm more focused on setting folks up for a healthy foundation for the rest of their adult lives until they can get closer to the point of like getting ready to actually retire. So I'd love to tell you about a client of mine. Um, of course, I have anonymized this, changed the name so that I can protect my client's confidentiality. But for you to get a sense of what I do, I wanna tell you how I helped this particular person. My client, Jen, is one of the people who came to me and said, River, I really wanna buy a house, but I have no idea how to do it. And so I sat down with Jen and I helped her get clear. And we figured out that the house that she wants would be a single family home She's fine with a row home, but she's looking for a single family, not a condo or a duplex. I helped her figure out that she does want to stay here in Philadelphia um, and it, within the city limits. Part of the reason Jen needed my support is that she wanted to be able to buy this house entirely by herself. She, didn't, she doesn't have a partner that she's buying the house with. She didn't have the option of family support of any kind. So she knew that she needed to be able to afford the whole house by herself. We figured out what are the necessary features for a home for her. Um, she wants a house with at least two bedrooms, lots of natural light, no major repairs needed. She would also love if it was close to public transportation and had central air conditioning, which we in Philly know is not a given. <laughs> so now that she has figured out what she wanted, we were able to figure out that a typical price for that house at the time that we did this analysis was about $250,000. So already I've helped at 
at this point, I help Jen figure out like, what is the actual thing that you want? What does it look like? What are the details? And what's that gonna cost you? So then I help Jen figure out what she needs to buy this dream home. She needs a good credit score, important there. She needs money for a down payment and closing costs. She needs an emergency fund. Big catch that I see with home buyers is even if they have enough money for the down payment, they're not always prepared for emergencies to happen. And I know emergencies are always gonna happen. Uh, Jen also needs the ability to pay a monthly mortgage payment. And of course, she's gonna need a connection to a good realtor who can help her find the specific home of her dreams. So Jen and I created an action plan. To improve her credit score, I told her to pay off the credit card debt that she has over the next four months. This is credit card debt that accumulated during the pandemic. She was able to keep her job through the pandemic, but her um, online shopping and ordering food got a little bit out of hand. And so we created a budget that's going to help her pay back that credit card debt and make sure she doesn't increase her debt. Um, I'm having her consider closing newer, line, newer lines of credit to help her average age of account look longer. I told her to request a credit line increase for all of the credit cards that she is keeping open, which may not be a good strategy for the short term, but is for the long term credit health. And we set some hard savings goals. So I generally recommend for a first time home buyer that they set aside 10% of the house price. 5% would be for down payment and 5% would be for closing costs. I would rather folks have a little bit more money than absolutely necessary to buy the house so that they're ready for whatever's going to happen to them. So we set a savings goal of $25,000. We also talked about an emergency fund and I recommended that Jen put aside 2% of the house price. So that's $5,000. And Jen already had $6,000 saved. So now she still needs to save $24,000. So we created a budget that's gonna allow her to put $1,000 aside a month so that she'll be ready to make that home purchase in two years. And we looked at her budget and we used a mortgage calculator to make sure that she will be able to afford the monthly mortgage payment on her own during the next 10 years or however long she decides to stay in that house. So that's a little bit about me and about what I can do to help folks. Uh, again, the business is called Be Intentional Financial. If anybody's interested in learning more, you can go to talkwithriver.com to schedule a time to talk to me. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, River, for that presentation. All right, and again, I um, want to remind the audience, uh, if you'd like to learn more about our speakers that we have today, you can go to our website. Uh, we have some a little intro and, and um, some words on their bio as well. Um, awesome, okay. So now I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, all righty. All right, thank you uh, so much. Um, I'd like to introduce Zach Wilcha. Um, let's see. He... Zach, do you have a uh, sharing, share screen abilities? Let's see. Um, right now it's disabled. Let's fix that for you. Sorry about that. No problem. Alrighty, you should be able to do it now. And another reminder, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so for audience members, if you would uh, like to send a, a question in the chat and we can come back to it at the end. Awesome, thank you. So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today at Venture Cafe. Um, I'm Zach Wilkham. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the first executive director of the Independence Business Alliance, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. I'm a recovering attorney, current nonprofit warrior, and a little bit of an entrepreneur being the first person who's in charge of this chamber. I'm a long-suffering Philadelphia sports fan, so this past week has been uh, difficult, but also completely expected from the perspective of somebody who's been watching highly ranked Philadelphia teams tank at the last minute. Um, if it's important to you to know, I'm a Sagittarius with Capricorn rising, oldest child of three, and an ENTJ, if you want to know psychologically where this presentation is coming from. And I always tell people I'm originally from the, off the area where the office takes place, but I'm a, a Philadelphia transplant. 
Before we usually get started with these conversations, we just wanna let people know a little bit about LGBTQ plus 101, that uh, gender does not equal sex, sex assigned at birth, or commonly referred to as sex as social, legal, or medical designation assigned at birth but on, based on a medical assessment of the body. Gender is how your identity relates to society's idea of what it means to be a woman, man, neither, both, or a mix of many genders, which we'll get to a little bit too. Gender is simply who you go to bed as, sexual orientation is whom you go to bed with. Um, and a quick transgender primer as somebody who is a cisgender ally of the community, um, because we'll be talking about trans businesses much today and you've already heard from two excellent ones. Um, transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or expression is different from cultural expectations based on the sex they were assigned at birth. It's opposed to cisgender, a term that's used to describe people whose gender identity aligns with the sex assigned to them at birth. And you'll often hear other terms under the trans umbrella, such as gender nonconforming, gender queer, gender fluid, transgender, agender, and more. And as we're talking about under the queer umbrella, there's LGBTQIA+, and many of these things are stuff that the audience knows today, but I just wanna go over them just in case there are folks in the audience who don't know. So a lesbian is a woman whose enduring physical, romantic, and emotional attraction is to other women. Um, some lesbians may refer to themselves as gay or gay women. And then gay is an adjective described to use people whose enduring physical, romantic, and emotional attractions are to people of the same sex. Um, sometimes it's a catch-all for the entire community. Bisexual is a person who has a, the uh, capacity to form those same sort of attractions to people of the same gender or those of a different gender. People may experience this attraction in differing ways and degrees over their lifetime on a spectrum. We just talked about uh, the transgender identity umbrella. And I should note here that we never use the term transgendered. It's transgender. Queer is an adjective used by some people whose sexual orientation is not exclusively heterosexual. Typically for those people who identify as queer, the terms lesbian, gay, or bisexual might be perceived as too limiting or too fraught with cultural connotations that they feel don't apply to them. And this was once considered a pejorative term, but queer has been reclaimed by some people to describe themselves. However, it's not a universally accepted term even within our LGBTQ community. Intersex is an umbrella term describing people born with reproductive or sexual anatomy and or a chromosome pattern that can't be classified as typically male or female. And asexual or aromantic are adjectives used to describe people who do not experience sexual attraction or um, romantic feelings um, at all. So they, meaning they do not experience this type of attraction. And the plus more, there's many terms like pansexual, homoflexible, two-spirit, which is mainly used in indigenous communities. There's all sorts of things under the queer umbrella. So uh, what we run is an LGBTQ plus chamber. And you might be wondering why LGBTQ plus chambers are necessary in a world where there are already so many chambers of commerce. So I wanted to give you a small, but not at all exhaustive list of reasons why. One thing is that we provide access, education, and resources for LGBTQ1 businesses, LGBTQ plus employees, and even our visible allies as well. We provide networking and support for LGBTQ plus employees. We create and strengthen business and management allies, meaning we want people who are managing LGBTQ plus folks to be conversant and friendly in the terms and understand the specific needs and desires of LGBTQ plus people in and out of the workplace. There's also supplier diversity opportunities, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. And it's a very unique intersection of advocacy interests where we want to use the, we want to leverage business success of LGBTQ plus individuals, as well as making sure that we're leveraging that to uplift the most marginalized in our community. And another thing we try to do is to dispel the myth of gay affluence. I think because of representation in certain media, you would think that gay people are all white cisgender males who have plenty of disposable income and that those people do exist. And uh, some of us might envy them, but they're certainly not representative of the entire community. And in fact, uh, the pandemic has laid bare many of the inequities that have happened in uh, uh, across a broad spectrum of communities, but especially in LGBTQ plus communities. 
For example, our community is at greater risk of experiencing economic insecurities due to disproportionate economic hardships, uh, such as higher rates of poverty and unemployment, greater food insecurity and vulnerability to homelessness, and workforce discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. These conditions and disparities do predate the pandemic, but they've also been exacerbated by it. A key driver of economic and employment instability among LGBTQ plus communities is the prevalence of discrimination when attempting to enter the workforce and maintain employment. A third of LGBTQ plus Americans reported discrimination moderately or significantly affected their ability to be hired. A third of LGBTQ plus Americans had their work hours reduced during the coronavirus pandemic and two thirds of LGBTQ plus households have experienced financial problems during the coronavirus pandemic. So this is another reason why LGBTQ plus chambers are necessary because many LGBTQ plus people are marginalized out of workforces and are forced to become entrepreneurs. Many of them do it of their own volition and they love it and they're born with an entrepreneurial spirit, but we can never forget the fact that many people in our community are marginalized into having to form a hustle for themselves that's going to work as a long-term career. So to that end, I love to talk about statistics as well. 4.1% uh, of Americans over the age of 18 um, identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. The buying power of the LGBTQ plus segment is forecast at $917 billion in 2015. Like I said, gays and lesbians are twice as likely to own a small business or be self-employed. And there's a uh, missing data in there on transgender businesses, but we're hoping to have some of that soon as more and more transgender people form their own businesses. And LGBTQ plus business owners um, represent over $1.7 trillion in economic impact we create jobs and innovate business solutions nationwide. If we all, uh, if all LGBTQ plus business, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and more had our own island, we would have the ninth biggest GDP in the world, bigger than Canada, Australia, and Russia. Also, it's exciting for consumers. 55% of LGBTQ plus consumers choose to do business with companies that they know have a commitment to diversity and equal treatment of employees. 46%, uh, almost half, prefer products from companies that support nonprofits serving the LGBT plus community. Seven out of 10 adults say that it's important to them to know that a financial institution does not discriminate. Three out of four LGBTQ plus individuals have changed brands when a company has exhibited LGBTQ plus support. And LGBTQ plus computers have a, has a, consumers have a deeper trust for products and services that target and support our community. There's a great consulting group called Get Fluid that put together some of these stats about the business case for intentional inclusion that we should all be thinking about. So 46% of employees remain in the closet at work, which is astronomical. That's an insane amount of people that are in the closet at work for what is purportedly a very friendly LGBTQ plus environment right now. Unwelcoming workspaces can cause a reduction of 30% employee engagement and productivity. 73% uh, of employees who hide their identity at work will most likely leave within three years. Pronoun use and sharing, like I did at the beginning of this presentation, have become common and expected. Um, different policies affecting sexual orientation and gender identity expression increase job satisfaction, commitment to employer, and even health outcomes for LGBTQ plus folks. And communities with LGBTQ plus inclusivity highly outperform others in their sector. And right now, almost eight in 10 folks in Gen Z claim that a company's DEI policies are a determining factor for their choice of employer. I just wanted to note here that our chamber is not alone. We are a part of a nationwide network of 62 different affiliates that are part of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. And here are some great stats that were put together in 2016. And we know that things have become even more impressive since then. We already talked about the 1.7 trillion in the US economy that we contribute. We've created at least 33,000 jobs through entrepreneurship. Um, approximately 2.5 million in annual revenue is an average and 12 years in business is what most LGBT businesses have by average, which is far over the national average. And we should also say that in 2015, more than 17% of LGBTQ plus businesses were owned by people of color, which was far above the national average. So when we talk about supplier diversity, we want you as corporations to hire the folks that you're hearing talk today. 
Um, a supplier diversity program is a business program which encourages the use of minority owned, women owned, et cetera, all of these different classifications that you bring into your commerce stream to help our communities. Um, over one third of Fortune 500 uh, companies recognize LGBT plus certification, and we're working on getting that done in the city of Philadelphia as well. But you can see other cities in the country that are already doing so. Our own chamber, the Independence Business Alliance, uh, does um, many different things. We represent 11 counties in this area. We have about 325 to 350 members. And we represent everyone from the businesses that you're hearing about today that are solo owned startups, all the way up to the Comcast, the Picos, the large corporations of the world that we wanna make sure are using LGBT businesses in their commerce streams. We have an intersections program, which is our commitment to working with African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American chambers in our area to make sure that we're speaking with a unified voice, particularly in a post pandemic world. And one program that we're especially proud of is our trans work program, which is filling a critical gap in addressing under and unemployment by connecting transgender and gender non-binary job seekers and entrepreneurs to a network of supportive employers and business partners. It's the first of its kind run out of a local chamber. And right now we're holding job fairs, job prep seminars, legal workshops, and educational panels for trans folks and allies to uplift TGNC communities. Finally, we always like to leave folks with a take home lesson. So if you're a startup and you want to know how to be inclusive and, and equitable, we always tell people that company policies are the minimum expectation. You have to understand the formal mechanics of the law versus how they actually play out in the workplace. And clear and robust policies are a great starting point. We encourage folks to establish employee affinity groups like ERGs and promote the benefits of diversity within your workplace not only because they operate and better and more productively, but also because it's a moral imperative to do so. Inclusive company culture always begins at the top with visible, loud, and confident support. Helping allies be visible is also necessary. Ally is a verb, so you wanna give your allies and your company something to do, whether it's symbols or pronouns or mentorship, and also engaging with the community, but not just once a year. Um, not just beyond the obvious events like Pride Month or crises that happen, all year long, we should be celebrating pride. We should be celebrating African-American history all year long. We should be celebrating women's history all year long. I promise everybody that I am probably gayer in December than I even am in June. So please celebrate pride all year long. So I also thank everybody very much for listening to us. Get in touch with us at www.thinkiba.com or email me at zach at thinkiba.com. We'd love to hear from you and make you part of our community. So thank you so much, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Zach, for that amazing presentation. It's very informative. Uh, I really enjoyed learning about that. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Matt Tini. Um, Matt, let me know whenever you're ready. All right, let me try to share the screen now or my graphic. Um, so do I do, do advanced sharing option? Is that right? I think. <laughs> Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not a big PowerPoint person. So um, today I'm really gonna focus on you know, just basically like how I got started in my company, um, you know, and, uh, you know, how did I get here today? And then also like, what were some of the obstacles, right? Like um, my business, you know, I started in February of 2008. It was just me doing what I love, systems management solutions using Microsoft management technologies. Um, and actually the idea came to me from one of my mentors, and they said, why don't you start a business doing what you already know? Because I was going to start a business doing something I knew nothing about. So that's kind of where the idea came from. Um, and I kind of grew it from there. You know, one of the things that I learned along the way um, is really the, the focus on relationships, um, which is really the reason I kind of put this together. Um, this graphic um, is actually from 
a mentorship program that I did with a large company, um, thanks to the NGLCC, which um, Zach uh, kind of pointed out. Um, it was a one-year program, and I met with different business um, areas within this company. And all of these areas around the relationships, um, which are at the center of everything in, in, in business, were kind of things that I took into my own business. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, business is relationships. So the focus on there's enough to go around that abundance mentality is so important, especially for, um, you know, recovering out of a pandemic. Um, and, you know, what I mean by that is like being okay to sub, um, be a subcontractor, being okay to be a sub of a sub. Um, you know, because experience is experience. If you're just starting your company, you know, you want to get in front of the right people. It doesn't necessarily need to be directly with a client. It could be with someone that has a relationship already. Um, the other thing too, like, is really keep it simple in what your intention is, you know, keep it focused on an image or a, a vision board of everything that you want to have happen. Um, from your business, right? What are the good things in your life that you want um, to have be fulfilled? Um, the other big thing is like surround yourself with those that you know, trust and respect, um, like mentorships, um, mentors, advisors, like people that are really, um, that they have your back. When things get rough, you want to have someone in your corner. Um, you know, that's, that's another big thing that's really helped me um, over the last 14 years. The other thing is like focus, focusing on my daily practices, right? Before I start my day, I always get grounded and I get my energy grounded into what really matters. What, what am I focused and committed to? Um, also like sharing my own personal story. I didn't actually really, um, I wasn't really out on my business until about five years ago. I mean, obviously you can tell that I'm LGBT. Well, for most of everyone. Um, by the way, I forgot to say my pronouns, he, him, and his. Um, so, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's been a journey, right? Um, when I first started in my career in like 1998, I started in IT. There were no ERPG groups. There were no, there were no support groups. Um, so as I, as I came out of my business, I realized that this was a personal journey for me. Um, you know, and I always felt like I was, I always felt like I wanted to hide um, in all of my jobs. So that's something big is to like recognize that, like it's okay. Like it's okay to be where you are. It's okay to be where you are in your journey. Um, and you don't need to force anything. You know, when you're ready, you'll, you'll do what's right. But for me, you know, I also work in the business with my husband. And so it kind of got to a point where it was like, you know, in meetings, it was really awkward that your, your husband is sitting there yet no one else in the room knows that yet there's that awkward silence. So like really owning that and like recognizing like that doesn't work, like you need to be authentic because it eventually shows up in the relationships with people that you work with. Um, the things to like, as far as obstacles that were extremely important is like being aware of that, like your journey and your path is your own, like just owning it is so important and critical. Um, in my business, my employees are the focus of my business. Customers are not. Um, the, 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 the reason for that is like our, our focus is on building a culture and having people like retire with us and like retention. Like I have people that have been with us since the beginning and it's because of the way that we support them in their career, but also recognizing um, that everyone is in different places, um, having um, a diverse workforce, um, focusing on how do we empower our staff? How do we have them show up to be their best? Um, you know, the other things around obstacles are like the approach in the business is really how do we show up for others so that they can be showing up to be great for our clients? You know, being a generous listener, because I find a lot of times like in business, especially in the tech space, like it's very rapid. 
and it's very fast paced and everyone gets caught up in like the next engineering, um, you know, innovation or new technology. And we kind of lose focus on like what actually matters is the people, right? So that's been really um, extremely important. Also being empathetic. Oh my God, like that's super big. Like being empathetic, like leading with empathy and like showing that your, your personal story and like your own like recognition of like, wow, like I totally didn't handle that the way that I, I could have handled it better. Um, and like just leaning in and being vulnerable is, is super, is a super strength. Cause like, I used to have it like that it was a weakness. So like, I lean into that now and I'm like super aware of that when I'm talking to people. Um, you know, the other thing is like be, building teams, um, building a culture, you know, that again, empowers people, but also having people be accountable in a way where they come to us rather than us chasing people. So for example, we have consultants that are billable. They're expected to work X amount of hours a week. So rather than us chasing people, we create a culture where people are accountable and they come to us on Tuesday and they say, we don't have enough work. You know how much time that saves the business and how much more productive we are just from that simple little thing. So there's really that sense of ownership that starts to happen too. Um, that's been big. Um, the other thing is letting go of control and being open and honest with myself. And like that started with me getting my own personal journey and reaching my own level of incompetence in the business. You know, last year in September, I actually got really sick and I had to step down as the CEO of the company that I started. And, you know, while I was physically sick, it actually allowed me to clear my brain and get to the bottom of like what is important to me. My, the importance for me is to have a place for my employees to grow. And they're not going to grow if I'm not, if I'm not at my full capacity doing what I love. So I actually promoted someone in my company to be the CEO. So that's a type of company that is available, you know, in the, um, in the community is you can build a company um, and promote within, but also empower people into doing what their strengths are. Um, so that's been big for me. And, um, you know, th this company that I started, it it's not just a company. This is like everything that I've put into it. It's been a personal journey and the personal journey shows up in the business's journey. So if I hadn't gone through last year where I got physically sick and stepped down as CEO, I may not, maybe the business would have turned out differently. Um, so it's really about those inflection points, you know, and personal growth and having it show up in the business in a way that gives you an opportunity to grow your business and look at where you're really excelling, where are you as the owner, your strength? Um, because honestly, that was the most difficult thing for me. And, you know, I think sharing it is is giving it freedom for other people to then get that it's okay. Like you, you can, you can lean in and, and be vulnerable, but you know, surround yourself with the right people. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to everyone about today. All right, thank you so much for that presentation, Matt. Um, all right, uh, now I'd like to introduce our last speaker, um, Donald Woodring. Hi, Don. How are you? Oh, I think you might be muted. Can everybody see the screen? Yep. Okay, well. Matt had talked just about being authentic and that's the antithesis of what I had done the vast majority of my life. Uh, Zach knows a bit about my story, but I completely live the antithesis of that. So uh, I didn't actually tell my entire story until just this past Christmas. So I really lived 
alive the vast majority of my life. So although I am the luckiest man in the world, uh, my mom was a drug addict and an alcoholic. So she had taken my two older sisters and my younger brother and, my, and myself, and she moved all of us kids out to Watts, California. Now, some of you all might be a little too young to know Watts, but you all might remember or know where Compton is, but it's all South Central LA, and that's where we lived. And uh, it really, at that time, was uh, really the worst place to live in the United States. And um, it's where a lot of movies were made. It's where the uh, Williams sisters lived. Uh, it was really the worst place to live. It's where Charlie Manson lived. It was really a bad place. And there was a lot of, we didn't live there for very long, but it was an intense period of time. And it's where a lot of bad things happened to us. So, you know, everything from sexual abuse to incest. My mom used to take us to sex and drug parties. Her boyfriend was into child pornography. So eventually my father came out and took us back. So we went from that culture to living in central Pennsylvania, which was a bit of a cultural shift. So then we lived in central Pennsylvania where uh, I joined a lot of extracurricular curricular activities because even though it was a much safer environment, uh, it was not exactly the culture that I loved at, in my family. So I joined everything I could join. And fortunately, I was pretty good in those activities, but I was also a sports guy. So I played two sports very competitively. I wrestled competitively, even though you wouldn't know it today, I'm you know pretty fat right now. Well, fatter than I used to be, but I wrestled competitively and played tennis competitively. But at the same time, I had some medical conditions that we were unaware of. And growing up in central Pennsylvania, you didn't go to the doctor unless you're bleeding from the ears. So a lot of you who might be from central Pennsylvania would maybe understand that, particularly if you're a boy. So I was diabetic, type one diabetic. And because of that, and I also had muscular dystrophy. And because of that, you don't, you don't go to the doctor. And so I had all the ramifications from that. So I've had a couple of strokes, I've had a couple of heart attacks. Uh, and over time, I, you know, had a kidney transplant, then later I had a pancreas transplant. Then just really in the last few weeks, I went deaf in my right ear. I uh, said to a buddy of mine, well, at least I don't have cancer. And then I had cancer. And then I also have to apologize because I just two days ago went to my dermatologist and I said uh, for a follow-up and they said, well, you also have cancer in, in your right here around your nose. So that's why I have all the redness around my nose because he treated that in his office. However, of all of those things, the one thing I could not really accept and address, because all of those things I was really fairly easily able to address, because even though I compartmentalize those things, that's the same way I was able to address those things and overcome those obstacles. Uh, but the one thing I was able, not able to address was the fact that I was gay. And Zach knows a little bit about this, but I didn't kiss a guy until I was 48 years old. So I got married to a woman. I have two beautiful kids. Didn't love the process to have the kids, but have two kids. Uh, but while it was easy for me to accept all of those medical issues and the sexual stuff, it was the toughest thing was for me to come out of the closet. But eventually I came out of the closet. And even after I came out of the closet, it took me a year to kind of accept the fact that I was gay. Um, and, but even, even with all of those things, I never let those get in the way of me uh, overcoming some of those obstacles. So I was fortunate enough to, accept, uh, to be able to achieve a scholarship to study abroad in Mexico. So I lived for a year in Mexico and I spoke the language fluently. I was so lucky in three months, I spoke without any accent whatsoever. I won three state championships. I was even selected by a, a Fortune 500 company as their top national recruit. And even when I take a look at my grades, I have no idea why they did that, but I was just so fortunate because of that. And then uh, I had th four personal mentors. I was just so lucky in my professional career. My first personal mentor was the CEO of DHL. And then that was followed up by the CEO of Colt Manufacturing. Then my next personal mentor was a guy who started a company called WR Berkeley, which today is a 
Fortune 500 company. They're about $8 billion insurance company. And then uh, the co-chairman of Ernst & Young. And I was so lucky at 29, I was the CEO, I was uh, the country manager of Mexico. And at 39, I became the CEO of a public company here in Philly. And then I was only one of 10 people who was the CEO of a public company under 40. And I was just so lucky because of that. So one day I was just sitting in my office thinking, how could this kid go from you know, living in Watts to becoming a CEO of a public company? So what I did was I made a list of CEOs and entrepreneurs that I knew. And so I asked them if they would be willing to be mentors. So Matt referred to mentors and the importance of mentorship as you go in your career. And so I made a list of those who were allies or who were gay, like for example, myself. And so, and then they're global in addition to that. So here's some examples. So uh, Luis Araña, who's a Mexican guy who now runs a, a large third-party logistics business in Latin America, based in Latin America. Steph, actually Stephanie von Wadsdorf, she and her husband were the first people I came out to, out of the closet to. Uh, they were just really wonderful people to do that to. Jerry Quinlan, who used to be the CEO of uh, Logitech, his daughter's a lesbian. She's an author now and writes books. She just, I think, wrote her third book. Uh, and T uh, Tim Hassett, who used to be the president of Centauri Beam, he's a huge ally. So not only do we have mentors, but we've got gay mentors. I'm talking to Todd Sears right now. Todd started a company 10 years ago called Out Leadership. So we've also got a huge portion of uh, CEOs and notable entrepreneurs, not only for startup and startup companies and entrepreneurs, but for professionals who wanted to advance their careers. So I was so lucky to do that. And we're also unique in the marketplace because one of the things that we do is we vet our mentees. So that's to protect our mentors. The reason we're able to have and to attract world-class mentors is we vet the mentees. And we've actually even on one occasion kicked out a mentee because he violated our policies. And so we're really protective of our mentors. So when a mentee asks a question, they have to click off boxes. So for example, if somebody wants to start up or they're in the fashion industry, they click that box of what industry they're in. So it doesn't go to Jerry. So it doesn't go to a technical person. We have like one of the hundred best CIOs in the question or in the country. So if somebody's in the fashion industry, that question won't go to Fitch. The guy's name is Ron Fitch Okowski, we call him Fitch. But it won't go to him. The question will go to Stephanie or to Vicki Cantrell, who's a very, very well-known person in the retail fashion industry. Or it'll go to uh, Catherine Petralia, who was recognized as Forbes as one of the 100 most powerful women in the world. She knows all about startups because she lends money to startup companies. The other thing is we have a one-to-many relationship in terms of uh, mentor to mentees. That's a, a hugely powerful tool as opposed to a one-to-one -one relationship. So for example, I benefited tremendously from that. So what I learned from Bruce Edwards, who was the CEO of DHL was tremendous. But then what I got from Ron, Ron Whitaker, who was the CEO of uh, Cold, he's a well-known turnaround CEO. It was so much different from what I got from Bruce. And then what I got from Bill Berkeley, who started up an $8 billion a year business. I mean, that, it became an $8 billion a year business. But what I got from Bill was so vastly different from Bruce and from Ron. And then what I got from Bob Neary, God rest his soul, was so much more from a financial standpoint. So what you get from a one-to-many relationship is so much more powerful than a one-to-one -one relationship. Then in addition to that, our mentors, if they take an interest in a mentee, they can make a direct contact to a, a mentee. And we've had that happen on a few occasions. Nowhere else in the world can you have access to this kind of uh, mentor, the quality of mentors that we have. So you get unprecedented access to these kind of world-class mentors and the expeditious learnings and value that you'll get in here is really unprecedented. We're, we're also not a marketing house. I mean, a, uh, a uh, clearinghouse where we take a percentage of the a markup on the price that uh, the mentors or the coaches charge. That's what essentially happens in all these other 
clearinghouses that you get where people say, hey, we have all these coaches. And then the website services as a clearinghouse and they just take an additional markup. That's why we keep our prices so low. <clears throat> The, the social aspect of our business, it's just part of our DNA. We are, we know as all of our mentors know that we got to where we are because of the benefit that we had from our mentors. In addition to that, because of my personal story uh, and because I know what it's like to have been closeted for so long, it's just part of our DNA and part of our corporate culture. Even though we had no revenue in 2020, we gave away $50,000 in scholarships we just signed the largest uh, alumni association in the world. They have a relatively new LGBT center. We've already met with them. So every, um, every um, person who signs up who's a Penn State alum, we give back to Penn State and we've assigned a certain percentage of that that goes to the LGBT center. And we're working right now without leadership to give them $100,000 in scholarships. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Don, for that presentation. Um, all right, and now I'd like to initiate our Q&A session, um, part of this um, part of this session. Um, and Zach will be helping me also facilitate some questions. Uh, so for the presenters and um, to the attendees here, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them in the chat if that makes you more comfortable or um, just unmute yourself and, and speak as well. And you can also uh, use the hand raising uh, function on Zoom as well. So yeah. So I can hop in and ask a question at first here. Um, first of all, thank you everybody. We, we love when our membership can um, show the world the great things that they're doing. And I guess my question is to everybody, and I alluded to this a little bit when I was speaking, but I guess why was, how did you know that entrepreneurship was for you? And, and when did you know that? Was it after working somewhere else that it became clear to you? Have you always had the entrepreneurial spirit? I'm always interested in finding out what the genesis is for folks because it's always a, a different and unique story. So anybody can jump in unless you want me to call on someone. I, I like to go. Okay, Matt, go ahead. As I raise my hand instead of raising it for Zoom. Um, so basically the reason, one of the reasons I started my company was because of the lack of like support for, like I was never out in any of my jobs like before. Like there was no, everything was closeted. So, you know, I've had comments made after I've left companies from employees you know, my coworker saying, well, they, they've made statements about, well, they don't know what to do with you. They don't know what to do with this gay, this gay kid. Cause I was like right out of school and like comments like that only made my way, only made their way back to me because of people that I still have relationships with. So had I not known that I wouldn't even, even I, I wouldn't have gotten that, you know, personal firsthand knowledge of it, but that was what I was feeling. Cause I was picking up on like, you know, kind of like, you need to do these projects. We can't put you on these projects. We kind of like putting me in a box in a way without saying it through the actions. And that impacted my ability to really promote and excel within the companies that I was working at. And I would find myself one company after another. So after the fourth time I realized, you know what? I think it's time that I go out on my own and start building my own company with my own culture on how to treat people right. Cause like, it just kind of got to a point where it was like really old, you know, like not open and transparent. Um, couldn't really feel comfortable being who you are. You know, you, you don't share, you know, just the questioning around, well, who's your girlfriend assumptions being made. There was no pronouns at the time. It was, it was a very different time, but that was one of the biggest reasons that I started is to have that freedom, yeah. That's great, man. River, how about you? I saw you nodding your head as well. Yeah, I always knew entrepreneurship was gonna happen sometime in my life. My dad's a lifelong entrepreneur and he ran his accounting firm and his software company out of my house when I was a kid. So like having the employees stealing my ketchup, like it was always like, 
surrounded by entrepreneurship and I really was attracted to it. Um, I uh, decided to do it earlier in life than I thought I would because I'm trans. Um, I was working first in tech and then in finance and everybody was okay with me being bisexual, but I was kind of starting to feel out like if I came out as non-binary, how would that go over with my coworkers? And I appreciate what Matt said, like, they don't know what to do with me. Like that was kind of the vibe I was getting is like, just nobody would know what to do with that um, at best. And then at worst would be like, just refusing to respect that. Um, so the, the real catalyst was um, I was getting really unhappy at work and I was working at a broker dealer um, as a financial advisor. And my franchise advisor took me, my, my boss took me into the conference room and was like, hey, I can tell you're kind of unhappy lately. So I just want to like show you the path of like why you're doing this work and how your life is going to look for the next 10 years. And he like laid out what the next 10 years of my life would look like and how after 10 years, then I would be able to buy a portion of the business from him and get my own office and my own secretary. And, and I just started crying. I was like, I, the walls are closing and I cannot stay in this type of corporate environment. I can't keep living a lie and I can't keep panicking when I need to get dressed every morning because I don't know if I'm supposed to wear a suit or a skirt. <laughs> I'm in between and I don't fit here. Um, and so after crying in the conference room as he's trying to pump me up about my career, I was like, okay, it's time to quit and do things my way. Um, so I quit maybe a month later and launched my business six months after that. And in the meantime, in the six months between quitting and launching my business, I came out as trans non-binary. I changed my name to River. I scheduled surgery, like all the things that I knew that I needed. Um, and I've never looked back. I'm so much happier now. You are. And I'm so happy that I've been able to witness all of that. I've met you, I've known you for years now and I've seen the whole um, transition um, both like personally and professionally. And it's been amazing to watch. So thank you for talking about that, River. Thank you. How about you, Don? What, I, I know that you've been involved in just about every facet of business that we could possibly imagine. What, what led you to the entrepreneurship area? Well, I was just so lucky. I had a great career professionally and great mentors. So at almost every time when I thought about going into my own, I just kept rising through the ranks. And then what happened was when we decided to sell the public company I was running, I had the opportunity to buy it. And I delayed buying the company because I was going through a divorce at the time. So I was divorcing my ex-wife at the time. And, but then eventually I tried to buy the company, but the problem was I had delayed it just a little too late. So uh, even when I had gone through the process, I was not successful in the purchase because I was probably about, 60 days too late in putting in my offer to buy the company. It was an outstanding learning process, but because I was unsuccessful in buying the company, that's what uh, got me into starting my own business. Very cool, man, very impressive. Not everybody has the opportunity to like buy the company that they're working for, so that's- Right, yeah, it was really a great process. And I, it's really too bad I wasn't able to buy it, but right. uh, yeah. Thanks, Don. Braxton, if you're still here, I'd love to hear a little bit uh, too about what the, like how the entrepreneurship bug got to you. Sure. Sorry, you guys. I've been just trying to do too many things at one time. <laughs> um, but the entrepreneur bug got me. Um, I actually was raised by two entrepreneurial parents. My mother is a beautician. And then she had that, she had her own beauty salon for like 25 years, most of my life. And then now she actually owns her own trucking company. So she does that. And then my father, he actually is a mechanical engineer and he did side work um, outside of his company that he worked for and had his own business doing that. And then as I went through high school, he had a business um, actually a pole dancing business for like pachata, uh, merengue, all different type of dance, right? Actually in Philly on uh, Samson street, but he doesn't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, I just had two entrepreneur parents. I feel like I didn't want to go that route because I watched them for so long, like not even struggle, but just like laying everything out and like all the hours, like my dad used to fall asleep with his shoes on. Like, this is just how hard he worked. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get like a secure job, which I did. And I became a nurse, 
but just as the years went through, I, um, it just wasn't for me. It, I just, I just knew that I was missing something. And like, I always tell everybody like, you know, with my business, it's like my life's path. It's like, it's not just a, it's just not like some guy who started a business. Like this is really part of my life to make an impact for my community. And, you know, this is the way that the divine wanted me to go. So I'm just following my life's path now as an entrepreneur and, um, yeah, that's really it. Just just being forced in that direction, pretty much. That's great, and I love. I mean, I want to hear. I, I, we need your parents on a on a panel to hear all about what they did. <laughs> they sound like <laughs> yeah. some really amazing career transitions and businesses. Yes, but I also really love the common thread that um, that Matt started off with when he said that sometimes people don't know what to do with us, and I think that that's getting better little by little. I think that the, the fact that half of people are still closeted in the workplace is not a great sign that it's, it's moving as quick as we want it to. But yeah, and I, I mean, even I, in my, um, in my career as an attorney, it was, it was at a time when I was still introduced as like, there was another person named Zach in the department. So I was always introduced as gay Zach, even to clients. It was a um, really uncomfortable place to be. But that said, I know that I, I feel like my identity has like helped me in my career. And we've talked a little bit about how maybe being out of place has forced you into entrepreneurship or at least forced you on the path that you knew that you were going to enjoy going on. Can anybody identify ways that their identity has helped them as an entrepreneur or in their business specifically? Anybody can jump in or I can call on somebody. Okay, Braxton, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I kind of just said it, but it's really my transition that really pushed me to um, start my business. And if it wasn't for me transitioning, I don't think that I would have ever made it to where I am today. So it was really important for me to go through that life's process um, in order to reach where I am today. Definitely had a huge impact on how I approach financial planning and who I am serving and how. Um, so when I started at my old broker dealer, you know, I was trained in how to do financial advising the more traditional way. We're looking for lifelong relationships with clients who already have assets ready to invest. We hold their assets, we sell them products, we check in with them once a year. Um, but because I am a member of the LGBT community, I was looking around at my friends and I was like, Lots of my friends don't fit into that category of client, but could really use financial education and advice. So I was started trying to find ways to bring them into the firm that I was working for, but it really wasn't a great fit. So combined with me not feeling like a great fit as an employee, and then my clients not feeling like a great fit as clients, uh, once I launched my business, I was able to adjust the services that I offer to be more specific to the LGBT community. So like in my presentation, how I described that I typically work with folks for six months to just get them to the next level of the information that they need and the analysis that they need to make decisions in their own lives. Um, I, I'm able to like adjust these services to be helping folks and meeting them where they are. Um, I also know that financially, we as LGBT people often have different life experiences than straight cisgender people. Um, adoption is really expensive. Other family creation strategies, if the traditional method is not available to you, is, it can be expensive. Um, those of us who are trans and need uh, physical medical changes, like Sometimes insurance covers things and sometimes it doesn't. And that's a whole journey. Um, but even the concept of getting life insurance to protect your family, when you apply for life insurance, you apply as a man or as a woman. So for somebody like me who is not either of those, how am I supposed to get life insurance to cover my family? Um, so just being aware of those issues and concerns for our community and um, even uh, polyamorous families in the LGBTQ community. So when there's more than two adults that make up a family, when there's multiple partners involved and folks are trying to buy a house together or have children together, the legal and financial structures in the United States are not set up for that. So finding creative workarounds, like forming an LLC with your two partners so that the three of you are legally recognized as a company <laughs> and that way you can own property together and the different workarounds that we have to find. And you know, before we had marriage equality, we had to find workarounds there. And 
as non-binary people, we have to find workarounds. So like living kind of on the edge of what's expected and what the systems in the United States were designed for, um, we get a little bit creative, so. I love that you're, you're um, finding creative ways to work within systems to ultimately break them. And I, I really appreciate that. Yes. Don and Matt, how about you? Do you have any, um, how has your identity led to some of the successful ways that you run your businesses? So, I mean, as far as my business, you know, first off, um, I, I can relate with uh, River and the workarounds because me and my husband, we, you know, we, we were a domestic partnership in Washington. Then we got married in Connecticut, which was one of the first states. And it was like, you know, when looking back, it was like, wow, we really went through a lot of hoops, like to make this legitimate, like before the whole Dama thing was repealed. So that journey, and then like going through like our, we have um, twin boys um, that are 23 months old. And we went through like an agency and like, you know, they're biologically mine and, and my husband's, right? So the process itself was very eye-opening. Like, wow, like we have so much more work to do. Like it's not actually recognized, like in the States, every state does not recognize um, surrogacy, it, let alone the, the legal implications. There are so much red tape involved. But then when I look at it in, in the business too, we still have a lot of um, barriers for including which Zach knows my passion for this, but including LGBT in federal government contracting, it does not exist. That's my big focus now. Um, and I'm actually in the process of submitting an 8A application for socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. I'm actually proving and building the case through my past experiences to the T where I have to get affidavits. Like that's like being on the edge. Like that's like, that's like leading the way for other people. Like, and, 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 and that's kind of like where I am. It's like, there are so many loopholes and so many different ways that we can overcome the barriers, but we have to step out and lean out. And like, it's super uncomfortable. I have to be honest with you, especially this 8A thing, because when I look around there, I don't have anyone except for like one person and Zach knows her. She's um, the leader of the, the Maryland chamber. And she's the reason that I'm even doing this. And that's what, that's what it's about for me. It's really about paving the way for other people. Like River, you just gave me like all these other ideas, like around, if you have three people and like the LLC and like, I can totally like see that. Like most people don't know, they're not thinking like that. If they've not gone through those experiences and so I feel like that's kind of where I am. I'm like on the edge, like the federal government, but also like corporations, like a lot of these corporations, like they throw their logo up, but like, what are you doing the other 11 months of the year? Like, and holding them accountable and like leaning in and like asking them the hard questions. Like, that's kind of what I've been doing because like, I've had it up to here with all the baloney with the logos and like, what are you actually doing? Like, what's your spend with LGBT suppliers? Like, what are you actually like committed to? And like being okay with like them saying like, get lost. Like, we're not going to work with the jackass. Like, yo, excuse my language. Sorry. But you get what I'm saying. Like, it's just like, that's kind of where I am because I went through all these, these hurdles, like to have a family, like, you know, and I hear people complaining like, oh, you know, kids are so difficult. Listen, it took me three years to get the kids here. That's the easy part. Like having kids is the easy part. Like, you know, it's not, I can, parenting is, is, is challenging, but like getting them here and like going through all the red tape, like the financing, the legal, like, so yeah, I'm just, I get fired up with that one. Sorry. Actually, maybe I shouldn't apologize. <laughs> Don't apologize, Matt. This is, it's, it's also Wrath Month as well as Pride Month. So yeah. We love that too. Don, do you want to add anything to that? No, it's just, I have to tell you that I've had, I've experienced no benefit from being gay in my business, but maybe it has to do with, I have no idea how to do it or what is a benefit for being gay. And, you know, I, I haven't even tried to take advantage of being gay by being a minority or anything like that. So, you know, to Matt's point, 
I, I'm sure there's a lot of benefit by being a minority supplier because I know when I ran that company, we actively look for minority suppliers. But I, as a minority provider, have not looked to exploit that as part of somebody's spend. Got it. I mean, it, I wouldn't think of it as um, exploitation as much as leveraging. And I yeah, think well, I meant that. I meant exploit in a positive sense. Right. Yeah. There's a there's a real um, yeah way to like sort of even give back around that. But those are all really great answers and really varied. And I think that you know it also speaks to the fact that the LGBTQ plus community is not a monolith. Like what you're hearing right. today is for extremely different experiences through right. LGBTQ plus owned uh, leadership and business. And that's, I think, really great to hear. And just my own personal experience is um, like, I actually just got engaged in May and it was over doing taxes. We, we were sitting there doing taxes and we were like, this is just untenable. Like, how are people do how are people doing this after you bought a house? And it just really made me think of all of the folks, even before marriage equality, that had to sort of like reckon with these kind of things. So we've committed to never doing taxes as unmarried people again. And it was very romantic. And <laughs> um Allie, do you have any questions on your end for the folks? Yeah, sure. Just again, just thank you so much, everybody, for um, all your presentations. Um, I did have a question, and for uh, since this is being recorded um, for the attendees that watch later, um, I wanted to ask um, sort of your biggest piece of advice for people. Um, like Zach was saying, we just listen to so many uh, diverse stories and backgrounds, um, and also just diverse work fields. Um, and so I was wondering for people, um, so I'm also, I just want to say I'm a college student right now. Um, and I know a lot of people trying to figure out their lives. And um, if you guys have any um, pieces of advice for uh, just being a disrupt or being in the um, entrepreneurship uh, realm um, and navigating the workplace. Anybody can start. Well, I think this is a really interesting time to be graduating and moving into the world and um, finding yourself in the workplace. And, um, and so much of what folks who are just entering the workplace right now or just entering the entrepreneurship space right now are going to experience is, um, you know, any advice that we give is almost going to be useless because you really have to go through it for the most part. But one thing I will always stand by is that uh, you really do have to be who you are and be counted. And it's, and I don't mean this in like a, a super feelingsy way, uh, uh, although it is, I think it's, it's very important to like ostensibly be who you are wherever you can be, but I don't think you can operate as your whole self unless you're allowed to be your whole self. And I, when I say allowed to be your whole self, I mean both by wherever you're working, um, the management there, and also by your own self. You have to allow yourself to be who you are. And I would also say you're probably not coming out of college fully formed, even though that's the, <laughs> that's like the, the company line in America that like you are a fully formed individual after your higher education and you're ready to go, but you still have many, many years of learning ahead of you. So the one thing you can do is absolutely be yourself upon arriving at whatever the next stage of your life is. And, and take it from one who is not himself for 48 years. I, I would completely agree with what Zach says. Uh, if I take a look, I've only really had, say, three big regrets in my life. And every single one of them was from not following my instincts. And I would say, trust your instincts and be yourself. I think that's outstanding advice. So beyond anything else, those two things. So and a thing for me that comes up is, you know, the, the company that, you know, I started is not the company that I have today. And a lot of it has to do with what Zach said, the personal journey, the, the reflection points, the personal growth, having it show up in the business. But like, really for people that are graduating, like looking at like, what is a company doing with DE&I? Like, what is their diversity, equity, and inclusion practices? What are they actually doing internal? Speaking to people that work there, like 
kind of like the culture like that is like soup i would say like if i was coming out of school like i would be looking at that like before that wasn't even like available like i don't even remember any seeing anything like back in like 90s i mean so for me that would be something i would be looking at like as a college student like what are you doing to what are you doing for hiring a diverse and inclusive and equitable workforce what are your practices? Do you have ERPG groups? All the stuff that Zach offers, you know, what do they do at the companies that you're applying for? Um, and asking the HR people that, you know, um, you know, I part of my company is IT staffing. We we provide uh, workforce to um, you know Fortune 500 companies. So I look at that in retaining our own workforce, but I also look at that like from your question because i think it's it's an important one you know do you do you want to work for a company that doesn't have that on their website it doesn't have people that that look like you i mean let's be honest or that that identify with you like are and you can kind of get a feel for that like during the interview process like what are they asking you are they asking you for your preferred pronouns like, like all these things, like, and I'm not saying I know everything, but that's kind of how I look at it. And um, it's definitely a journey, definitely a journey. Um, so I'm 29. So I was a, just coming out of college seven years ago, um, trying to figure it out also. Uh, things that I've learned. Um, I, I like what everybody said so far, for sure. Um, and to reinforce something Matt said, like when you're interviewing for a job, you are also interviewing them to see if they are the fit for you. Um, I also think there's no shame in putting the most likely to get hired version of yourself forward until you get the job offer and then turning on exactly who you are because now they know that they want you. So now you can reveal more of yourself. Um, figure out the approach that works best for you. Um, I would say in your career, try as many stuff, uh, as many things as you can. Um, gener advice that I've gotten from older generations is to stay at a job for a long time so that it looks good on a resume. I don't think that's real anymore. I think it used to be the case. I don't think it's real anymore. If you're at a job six months and you get a better offer, do it. If you're at a job six months and you hate, quit. Like whatever you can do to try new stuff and figure out what you like and what you wanna do is a good time uh, or like is worth doing. Um, as far as entrepreneurship, uh, being an entrepreneur in my 20s has been lonely. All my friends have jobs and it is hard to talk about work with them because they don't understand what I'm going through and how the work that I do feels so much more emotional because every sales call is a live or die feeling. <laughs> so finding supports. I like how much everybody's talked about mentorship today. I've been very appreciative of the IBA as a source for me to talk to other entrepreneurs and find support and connections. Um, I hired a business coach during the pandemic, which is how I survived the pandemic as a business owner. I needed that level of help of like, how do I continue to make money in this environment? Um, so definitely seek help and seek like emotional support if you're going the entrepreneurship route. Wow, thank you. Thank you all so much for those responses. They were uh, super thorough and um, really appreciate them, especially uh, and, um, the other session attendees that will watch will definitely appreciate it too. Um, we're just about out of time, but anybody has any other questions that they uh, would like to ask the group, uh, feel free. We have till 4.30. If not, we can just talk to you. <laughs> One additional piece of advice that I would add is alluding to something River just said, and that's really defined your people. Um, whether it's in the workplace or out of the workplace, I think that having a group of people that's yours that you're able to talk about these things with is is extremely important. And I think that you know entrepreneurship is lonely, but I think that also being the only person of your identity in a large workplace can be lonely too. And it's yeah. It, and another thing that River said that really resonated with me is that, you know, when I, I did a, a mid-career switch as well, when I left uh, practicing law and both of my parents had a job when they got out of grad school. And then that was the job that they retired with. And a generation above me, I'm much older than River, but a generation above me was the kind that, you know, had the one job for their whole lives. And that's just not how things are anymore. And I believe that like, um, 
the Department of Labor says that the average graduate now is going to have five different careers as they, as they move through life. And you know, part of that is going to be scarcity of resources, but part of it is also like depending on how you feel about it and how happy you are. And I think that it's a, um, it's an encouraging number to know that people are so willing now to be able to change, to find what's going to make them happy. If I could be a financial planner about career changes for a second, like don't pay for grad school if you don't have to. Like I switched from computer science to finance. I didn't go back to grad school. I got hands-on experience at my job and I took the test to get the certifications I needed to call myself a financial planner. I see so many folks my age going to grad school so that they can make a change, but like be really, really sure that it's gonna pay off before you start paying for more school. Um, talk to somebody outside of academia, talk to a career coach or a financial planner or somebody outside of academia before you take out more student loans. Thank you. I completely agree with you that on that. I'd say two things. One, try as many things as you can. The best thing to do is try so many different things. And I'm talking about not only professionally in life. It's I, what I would say one of my best life lessons is to experiment different things. So for example, one time I was arrested for Christmas tree shoplifting on government property when I was in college. And the cops came and they said, who wants to go in the cop car? Because everybody couldn't fit in the trucks. I said, I will, because I'd never been in a cop car. So that was because I wanted to try to be in a cop car. I think try different things. I think experiment. I think those kinds of things are positive. Not to, not you should always go in cop cars. I'm just saying, try different things, experiment, professionally try different things. And, and I completely agree with River. I think college today and education today, way overpriced and overvalued, overvalued. So for example, I always wanted an Ivy League education. Penn State was the, mo the best school I could afford when I did my undergrad undergraduate degree. So I took some classes at Penn because I was in Philadelphia. I took a couple classes and then I dropped out because I was like, you know what? I was already a CEO of a public company. Why did I need to go to Penn? You know, so I dropped out. Uh, I didn't need it, you know? And it was just kind of a, a box I wanted to check. And there was really no value. And one of the things that I realized was the professors were actually intimidated by those of us in the class that had achieved a certain level of uh, success above and beyond what they had. And what I got out of the class was really nothing. So I would really, scrutinize to a much stronger degree what River had said, you know, before you invest all of these tens and even more of thousands of dollars in the education, you've really got to scrutinize what's the return much more to much stronger degree today than you had to in the past. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, and with that uh, concludes our session, Philly Pride LGBTQ Showcase. Uh, thank you so much to Zach, Braxton, River, Matt, and Donald for presenting today.